This happened when I was only five years old. I remember that my family was coming back home from my grandparents' cottage that day. While on the way home, I started to have an extremely painful toothache. It was so strong that I was crying and screaming out in pain. So my mom searched the internet for the nearest hospital. Unfortunately, the only one around the area we were in was a mental hospital, which only had a dentist room for the patients of the hospital and for some emergency situations. As my mom was nervous about the patients, we immediately ran to the dentist's room. The dentist was in his early 40s, bald, and I remember that he had a really weird, kind of funny look about him. As we walked in, I guess he was annoyed about the fact that I was crying back then. Hey, kid, shut up. Real men don't cry, he said. I was just a five-year-old boy. My dad got pissed off, but he controlled himself because we weren't able to find another doctor. Suddenly, the dentist became super sweet and told me to sit on the chair. While he was checking my mouth, he seemed kind of nervous, but he was also saying some jokes to my seven-year-old brother. My brother started laughing, and then... What the dentist did almost made my heart drop. He screamed to my brother, Stop laughing or I'll take your brother's teeth out, one by one. It was enough. He was a weirdo, and at that point, my dad was furious. He was about to beat up this madman, but thankfully my mom calmed him down. Of course my brother got scared and started crying. He told him to get out because he was so annoying that he couldn't do his work. So dad got out with my brother and mom stayed with me. Being paranoid, my mom didn't feel comfortable about leaving five-year-old me behind with a weird stranger. I remember clearly that he looked at me in a very weird way that gave me the creeps. Just then, mom asked him if she could use the toilet that was in the room. Oh, sorry ma'am. This isn't a restroom. It's a room we keep old stuff, he said. But we could clearly see the restroom sign on the door, and even hear the noise of running water that the toilet made. From that moment until the end, the dentist seemed anxious. He was sweating and his hands were shaking. When he finished with my tooth, we immediately left and went home and my mom called her sister to tell her everything about the incident. A week after, my aunt called my mom. Did you see the news? She told us that she saw a dentist who had killed a woman in her late 20s, and he was keeping her in his clinic's bathroom for almost a week. And the place... The place was the same hospital where we had gone before. Shaking her hands, Mom turned on the TV, and there he was. It was the same man who had checked my tooth. That explained his weird behavior and why he didn't let my mom use the bathroom. A dead body was only a few meters away from me and my family. The dentist was diagnosed with schizophrenia and finally sentenced to death. I'm so glad that my mom didn't go to the bathroom anyway. And from my experience, I learned something that I want to share with you guys. If you ever notice that someone has a weird behavior that makes you feel uncomfortable, don't just stay there. Find an excuse and immediately leave. And this might save your life. The brown sedan stopped on the side of the road, yielding to the strobe of the squad car behind it. On a ghostly black road in the middle of nowhere, a veteran officer was walking a rookie through his first night of rounds, 
and his first possible traffic citation. This car was going 20 under, making it an easy target. See, now that we've run the plate number, the driver should be Fred Holes, an adult male. White, brown hair, brown eyes. Okay, you're up, kid. Just take it slow. License and registration. That's all you need to get. I'll get those and come back. I'll walk you through the rest. Jane told the rookie, trying to be as encouraging as possible. He looked nervous, but determined. Okay, uh, I got this, he said, and with a deep breath, stepped out of the car. Jane watched from the passenger's side, grinning a little, and remembered her first night pulling over strangers in the dark. She watched him shining his flashlight in, chest puffed out. He spoke briefly, then shined his light to the back seat, then back at the driver. The driver turned his head slowly and spoke a little. Her grin started to fade, however. The rookie was walking back, empty-handed. He pulled open the door and said quickly. She could see his pale face. What are you doing, kid? Where are his papers? She barked at him, but he didn't even look at her. We should go. Now. That was all he said, his face frozen, a head in fear. What are you talking about? We can't just go. What's going on? What could you spooked? He said nothing. She looked at the car ahead, and the driver was just sitting there. Fine, I'll take this one. Just breathe, kid. She sighed and stepped out. Jane shined her own flashlight and walked to the driver's side where the window was still rolled down. Putting the beam on the driver, she said assertively, License and registration, please. The man who turned his head slowly appeared to match the description of Fred Hall's brown hair, brown eyes. But the rest of him was wrong. His eyes were bloodshot to the point of bursting. His skin looked like plastic. His mouth cut on each side to outline his jaw. His hands were stuck to the steering wheel. Bright reflective piano wire working severed digits that tapped at the wheel. What the... She said. What seems to be the problem, officer? Said Fred, clanking his jaw every syllable. She could see the piano wire coming from the back of his head jerked like a fish on a line. She followed the line to see hundreds in the back seat. It was all leading to the trunk. Panning light drew her attention, and she looked to see the squad car turning around, and in disbelief she had to watch it speeding off without her. She drew her gun. And behind her, the car door opened. What seems to be the problem, officer? I look at the children in front of me. Smiling boys and girls, dressed in pristine uniforms, hair neatly combed, assembled in neat lines. All hoping for a chance to get into my school. Yes, my school. My school, with its Olympic-sized swimming pool and its sparkling blue water. My school, with its state-of-the-art classrooms and the best teachers and coaches money can buy. Everyone wants to attend my school, but I select only the best. I tell them to get changed, then lead them to the pool. They dive in like dolphins and begin to kick hard, bubbles streaming to the surface. I watch them with a hawk's eye, noting how they kick with healthy legs and healthy arms. One boy, though, impressed me. He is faster than everyone else stronger than everyone else, and he finishes first, then turns round and starts on the other side. Body glistening in the sun, water dripping off his skin like Neptune himself. He tells me proudly later his name is Peter. I tell him equally as proud that I'm thrilled to accept him into my school. He squeals like a little kid, and the excitement rises to his cheeks. His parents' eyes were misted with pride. The scribble on the contract seals the deal. Once all the paperwork is done, I lead him away to prepare. Lying him down, I sharpen my silver knife. I then bring it down, severing his arms in a swift chop. 
Blood gushes out of his wounds and pools on the metal table, dripping onto the floor. Peter moans, but I know he's a brave boy. Placing him carefully in a wheelchair, I wheel him to my car, which will take him to the best sporting school in the universe. I know he will do very well. After all, we always win gold at the Paralympic Games. Always. I live in Oregon in an area that has a lot of open areas like farms, lots, and just open fields. We also live about six miles from the nearest city. My parents own a lot of land, including our backyard, which is a well-kept area. And then it turns into a forest. Well, about 10 years ago, in 2011, for about a week or so, I remember hearing weird stuff out in that forest. And one day, my father said that he was grilling, and he went inside. He went inside for maybe three minutes. But when he came back outside, the grill was open, and all of the meat was gone. He thought maybe it were raccoons. So again, he grilled another day, and the same thing happens. After the second time, my father went to check the tapes, and what he saw was terrifying. It looked like something from a movie, like the movie Signs, the alien movie. It was very skinny, with no hair on its body, with eyes that would not be considered human eyes. My dad was a jokester, so I was convinced that he was playing a joke on me. He told my uncle what was going on, who's a police officer. He called him over to the house, showed him the video, and asked what he could do. My uncle didn't take my father serious, just like me, because my father was always playing jokes on people. To shut my father up, he told him that he would look into it. They decided not to tell my mom, because she would freak out. I've never seen my father be this serious before. I thought it was just great acting until I woke up out of nowhere that same night. I heard the same sounds I had been hearing before. My room was in the back of the house on our second floor and I always kept my window open. So I looked outside in the darkness of the forest and just stared for about a minute. At that point, it was time for me to investigate. I had to see what it was or who that was messing with me. I watched a lot of military and spy movies, so I decided to sneak up on whatever this was with my camera. I went outside, silently walking into the forest with my night vision on. And this is what I caught on camera. I'm hearing the things in my woods again. I don't know if you can hear the noise. I'm recording with night vision right now. I've been hearing the uh, sounds in the back of my woods quite a bit back is that oh I know that's what I've been hearing but I'm not sure what it was or what it was doing, honestly. I just know that I surprised it. I'm not one to say that this was something weird, but maybe it was an animal. But it didn't look like any animal that I've ever seen in this area or any human. What do you think it was? Jolene stood before a big oaken toy box. It had been over 15 years since she had last seen it. Now here it was, in her late mother's attic, gathering dust. She thought of long-forgotten memories of her and her brother Zack sitting in front of it, playing with their toys. Tears began to well in her eyes. She had not thought of Zack in a long time. In fact, she couldn't remember the last time she had remembered him at all. But looking at the toy box made the memories trickle back to her mind. It began to play inside her head like a movie. In their bedroom, Jolene and Zack were sitting on the floor in front of the toy box. Zack was bashing cars into each other, and Jolene was brushing her Barbie's hair. Their mother was out with her new boyfriend, and they were left to look after themselves. Why was it suddenly coming back? She blew dust off the top of the toy box and wiped the rest of it with her sleeve. 
She looked at hers and her brother's name scratched into the wood, and drifted into another memory. The night she had scratched their names onto the lid of the toy box with a knife she had grabbed from the kitchen drawer. Her brother was cooking dinner, doing the best he could. Although their mother hadn't left them much, Zack had found half a bag of pasta in the back of the cupboard, just enough for him and Jolene. Once the dinner was served, they both sat down on the floor and ate plain undercooked pasta. Jolene wiped tears from her eyes. She couldn't believe it had been so long since she thought of him. But now it was all flooding back like an unstoppable wave inside her mind. Zack and her mom were shouting in the kitchen, and it woke her up. Jolene went over to the bedroom door and held her ear up to it. You're always out, it's not fair! It was Zack. He was crying. Why would I want to be here with annoying goblins like you two? I've got better things to do! Their mother shouted. But... but we love you! Can love pay for the fucking rent? No, no it can't. Zack stormed to his room, weeping. And a moment later, Jolene heard the front door slam as their mother left too. That was all she remembered. All she needed to remember. It was clear to her now what had happened to Zack. He had been missing since that day for 15 years. Police never found him. Of course they never found him because... Nobody checked the toy box. Could it be? So my mother told me this story years after it happened. My dad was a truck driver at the time he left the military in the early 70s. By the time my siblings and I were born, he only drove in our home state of Texas, and summers were extremely busy for him. This incident happened during the mid-80s on one of his extended trips across Texas. I believe he was driving south on 281. He was getting tired when he pulled his rig into the parking lot of a truck stop. He was making his way to the on-site convenience store when he noticed a young woman pacing back and forth in front of the shop. She looked to be in her early 20s, slim, very pretty, blonde, and wearing a tank top with cut-off shorts, normal attire for Texas summers. She was carrying what looked like a plate covered in aluminum foil, as if she was making her way home from a family barbecue. He finished his business in the store and headed back to his truck. As he got in, he was stunned to see that the blonde woman was now sitting in his passenger seat. He was utterly shocked. He had no clue who this woman was or how she got past his locked door. My dad was always very vigilant on the road and never left his truck unlocked. He demanded that she get out of his truck. He wasn't afraid at this point, but something felt off about this mysterious woman. She sat there and looked at him with the covered plate on her lap not saying a word. For a moment he wondered if he should just get out, walk over to the passenger side door, and just yank her out of the cab. But he decided against it. I'm still not sure why. The whole thing was beyond strange, so my dad, against his better judgment, turned his rig on and drives off, with the blonde woman still in his passenger seat. A few miles up the road, he attempts to make conversation. I guess he was trying to quell the extreme discomfort he felt. He asked her name, but again, the woman remained silent. As they continued down the highway, lustful thoughts began to creep into my dad's mind. I'm sure it had been a while since he had last seen my mother. Out there in the rural Texas roads, who would find out? Just this one time, what could happen, right? My dad puts his hand on her thigh, right above her knee. As soon as he touched her, the blonde woman turned from a gorgeous young woman into some kind of hellish monster. Her face turned rugged, and her eyes were now black pits. Her teeth had turned into sharp fangs with a long, unnatural-looking tongue. The demonic figure let out a guttural hiss.
From the plate she was still holding came the sounds of slimy movements, as if there was a pile of writhing worms beneath the foil. A putrid smell permeated the truck's cab, and my dad quickly turned his face from her and managed to bring his rig to a stop on the side of the road. As the truck came to a halt, my dad opened his door and jumped out of his truck. After taking a few moments to compose himself and allow his breathing to return to normal, he looked back at his truck. The demonic woman had vanished. He was now alone on the road. He started to pray, asking for God to rebuke the evil spirit. He eventually got back into his truck and drove off. The woman did not return. However, it was a while before the lingering stench dissipated. When my dad got home from that trip, he recounted everything to my mother. He had been so scared that my mother would not forgive him for his unfaithful indiscretion. He had seen a lot in his life, but nothing had ever frightened him like that before. He blamed himself for having impure thoughts, and perhaps that's why he attracted the evil spirit. I know many might say that people cheat on their partners all the time, and nothing like this happens to them. I can't explain why. I only know what happened to my father on the dark, lonely roads of Texas. When I was older, I brought up this experience to him and asked, Dad, did that really happen to you? He would never respond with words and just nodded. Back when I was 12, me and my buddies got to go trick-or-treating for the first time on our own. We had a curfew of 9pm sharp and by around 8.30, we suddenly decided that we didn't have nearly enough candy for our liking. So we started going really quick from house to house, trying to cover as much ground as possible. When our watches hit 8.45, most of us are suggesting just call it a night, but I had my heart set on one more house. No one wanted to get into trouble, but I'm insisting, like, just one more house. Think of the candy. That's what tips the balance, so we walk over to this one last house, up the driveway, and to the front door. I remember just instinctively pressing the doorbell, not even really looking at the door itself, so it took one of my friends to be like, Dude, look. I look, and I see the front door is actually open. It was only ever so slightly ajar, but it was open. I gave my buddy a look as to say, what? But we didn't push the door open or anything. I just carried on buzzing the doorbell, like maybe it had been left open on purpose. Another one of us called out, hello, but we didn't hear anything back and we were just about to walk away when we heard something from inside the house. It sounded like a thud, like someone, I don't know, kicked a couch or something. Not a super alarming sound, but... Enough to have us stop, turn back, and wonder if we shouldn't maybe check it out or something. Again, one of us calls out, Hello? Is anyone there? Only this time, I step forward to push open the front door. What we saw was a long, cream-colored carpet with what was obviously blood on it. There was blood on the carpet and blood on the door and its handle. We all see it, and for a second... We're all just totally dumbstruck. Then one of us just sprints off in the direction of a neighbor's house and bangs on the door. Within about 20 minutes, the street outside is just flooded with blue and red flashing lights and me and my buddies are sat on the curb outside answering some cop's questions. The worst part was when they wheeled someone out with a sheet over them, so we knew whoever's blood it was probably wasn't with us anymore. As you can imagine, our parents must have been pretty livid with us because we didn't get home until about 10.30. But since we were with cops, they knew something must have happened. I remember my dad kept checking the newspaper for any info, but all he could find was this tiny mention of a home invasion on Halloween. I guess the perps had knocked on the front door or maybe fooled the guy into thinking that they were trick-or-treaters. We didn't even get to save the guy. Like I was hoping that yeah, our whole year had been messed up with this thing, but at least we get to take credit for saving somebody whenever the EMT showed up, but we didn't get there in time, and he must have bled out pretty quick. 
All that after me insisting one more house. Just one more house. I married my wife four years ago, and we finally moved into our dream house this year. It's a rustic home that's over 150 years old and on the very edge of town, but still within walking distance to everything we need. At some point, my wife had been convinced that our house was haunted. She kept telling me she heard voices when she was in the basement. I went down there with a baseball bat just in case someone was hiding down there. However, no one was there. Our friends started to worry about her mental health as she kept telling them about the voices she heard in every room in the house. I ended up bringing her to a doctor, but he couldn't find anything physically wrong with her. Then I asked a local priest to come over to our house and give it a blessing, and he agreed. My wife seemed much more relaxed after he left. She claimed the voices stopped, but she still didn't like to be left alone in the house. One day, I had a business trip to attend, and that would mean I was away for the week. I asked my wife to invite one of our friends to spend the week with her, but she refused, saying that she no longer heard the voices. After the trip, I came home, and to my horror, I found my wife's body hanging from the banister. She had written a note saying that the voices wouldn't stop. I immediately called an ambulance and they arrived within minutes. Of course, she didn't make it. All of my friends and family gave me sympathetic looks at the funeral, as they knew how crazy my wife was at that time. However, it was alright. After the funeral, my girlfriend helped me remove the hidden speakers as we prepared to start our new life together. Jeremy fumbled awkwardly in his pocket with his free hand, searching for the keys to the front door. He'd wished he'd have left the porch light on, but no, that was out of the question. He couldn't risk the chance of being seen with this parcel slung carelessly over his shoulder. After what seemed like an eternity, his fingers finally closed around his lucky pink rabbit's foot. It was a gift from his wife. Yeah, not so lucky tonight, he thought ruefully. He withdrew his keychain from his pocket and miraculously singled out the house key from the others. He inserted it into the knob and turned it. There was an audible click sound as the mechanism disengaged. He glanced over his shoulder, looking at the neighborhood cautiously. It wasn't very late in the evening on this fall night, yet it had already grown dark. Most of his neighbors would be enjoying their dinner or catching up on the evening news, so he wasn't too concerned. Seeing no one, he turned the knob and began to open the door, then suddenly hesitated. Was that? No, no, couldn't be. He could swear he heard a muffled giggle from inside, but he must have been mistaken. He knew the house was empty. He took a deep breath, coaxing himself to relax as he stepped through the threshold. The increasingly heavy and frustratingly awkward parcel was nearly slipping from his grasp. He entered the doorway, closed the door behind him, and fumbled with the light switch. Suddenly, his living room was awash in bright overhead lights and... Surprise! Stunned, he gasped. Before him, leaping from corners and shadows, and from behind the couch in the bar, were dozens of people. Family. Friends, co-workers, neighbors, everyone was here. He was completely dumbfounded. Happy birthday! (laughs) The parcel that was precariously balanced upon his left shoulder slipped and thudded to the floor. From within the loosely round roll of discarded carpet, his wife's hand flopped out, and her wedding ring sparkled beneath the fluorescent bulbs. On Monday, Eric was glaring into his mirror, noticing his hairline was pushing further back. He rubbed his hand over his balding head. This is just great. I'm only 25, too. 
What I wouldn't give to have a full head of hair again. Throughout the day, he was yanking on what hair he had left to relieve his stress, even pulling out some strands. When Eric woke up on Tuesday, bits of hair had sprouted up again on his head. He couldn't explain it. It was like a miracle. On Wednesday, he woke up to his head fully covered, as if it had regressed back a decade and a day. He couldn't explain what happened on Thursday, though. Eric woke up to long, shoulder-length hair. He shrugged in the mirror and decided to keep it, not wanting to pass up the rare opportunity. Things were getting concerning when it was Friday. When Eric held his hair in his hands, it seemed to be growing at a visible rate. Eric was dumbfounded, unable to explain his ironic plight. He rushed over to a barber, begging him to buzz it all off before he was tripping over his own mane. It was a difficult process to fight back against the hair actively sprouting up, but the problem was subsided, for now. Eric woke up on Saturday surrounded by his own hair on his bed. The hair was really fighting back now, pushing out at an alarming rate. He leaped out of bed and haphazardly hacked his hair with scissors, but the hair still flowed out like a faucet. He dashed into his living room to give himself more space then soon realized he needed to run outside to give him more space. Ah! He screamed as he ran down the sidewalk, trying to hold up his hair behind him. The large mane was weighing him down, collecting twigs and stones while dragging on the floor. Eric eventually made it to an open field, hopefully giving him enough space. However, he had no idea how to combat it anymore. All he could do was stand in the field and wait for the hair to surround him. Ah! Eric held his head and shrieked like a maniac, unable to come to terms with his fate. One day, a gigantic bush was reported in the middle of a field. It had a disgusting smell, with clumps of dirt and small animals stuck inside. When police cut down to the center of the bush, they were shocked to find a human skeleton laying on the ground. I graduated from a Sam Houston State University in Texas back in the early 2000s. Like most college students, I had definitely encountered a handful of weird and quirky individuals, but none I'd remember like Bart. Bart wasn't his real name. It was Thomas, but since he had the middle name of Bartlett, he went by Bart because it suited him better. And boy did it ever. He had a mischievous streak that was a mile wide and often verged on criminal. At best, he was the life and soul of the party. At worst, he seemed downright dangerous. Sometimes he got it into his head that certain people were just out to get him, and he always talked about his parents like they were the two evil tyrants in his life when it was common knowledge that they spoiled him rotten with cars, gifts, and a free ride through college. One time, when this one kid made him mad, Bart broke into the guy's dorm and tried to steal his computer. I think he only dodged getting kicked out of school after he convinced everyone, including the victim, that it was just kind of a prank gone wrong. But we all knew the truth. He really had wanted to hurt that kid. I just didn't think he had an actual violent bone in his body. But as it turned out, he actually kind of did. I remember he asked me out of the blue one time, how much money would it take for you to kill someone? We were always asking each other dumb questions like that. Like, who'd win between a bear and a lion? Weird, would you rather questions that were usually pretty not safe for work. So as much as I didn't take the question seriously, I still gave a moment's worth of thought. I remember telling him I wasn't sure. That'd have to be at least half a million. But then he looks all annoyed and asks, You wouldn't kill someone for ten grand? I responded, God no, dude. It'd have to be like retirement money. He comes back with, Twenty grand? I just laughed the question <laughs> off at that point. But then he just ups it by ten grand at a time until I gave him a definite no. A few moments of silence go by while he thinks, then he says, Fifty. I'd give you fifty. I'm literally about to ask him why he's obsessing when someone else appeared and called out to us and Bart dropped the issue. 
I remember thinking it was a weird question to begin with, but the way he asked it was even weirder. Almost like he was really thinking about trying to hire a hitman or something. But we always talked about dumb stuff like that, so I guess I just forgot about it after a while. Sometime later, Bart drops out of college for some reason, probably something to do with the fact that he barely did any of the work and that was pretty much the last we saw of him. I mean, we keep in touch every so often, planning to do stuff but never actually doing it. Then this one time, Bart is texting my roommate who in turn tells me that Bart was saying he was going to come visit, only he was serious this time. He said he was about to get his hands on some trust fund of his parents that he had kept safe for him and how he'd pay for us all to go down to Mexico for spring break the following year. I'm like, cool. I didn't believe he'd actually come visit, but I figured maybe a cash injection might help him get his butt into gear. Bart never did come to visit though, and we found out why when my roommate called me into his bedroom to show me something on his computer. Bart's entire family had been killed, and he'd been shot in the arm and would seemed like a home invasion gone wrong. We tried calling him a bunch, but he didn't answer his phone, so we figured he either wasn't out of the hospital yet, or he just wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, which I found perfectly understandable at the time. I can't even imagine how devastated I'd be if something like that happened to my family. Then, over the course of a few months, the truth came out. It started when Bart was arrested, we were just confused at first, but the only thing we could think of was that the cops had somehow found drugs or something else illegal in Bart's possession while searching his home. I mean, we knew he'd been shot in the arm, we'd seen it on the news, and they had a suspect in custody who'd fired all ten shots or whatever, so why arrest Bart? Long story short, they arrested Bart because the cops found out he actually knew the home invader. Then once they checked his phone, they found text messages from the same guy where Bart was arranging for the guy to kill his own family. They even talked about how the guy would need to shoot Bart to make it look authentic and how the shooter had to make sure his entire family was dead, otherwise he wouldn't get paid out of the inheritance. I knew Bart was crazy and I knew he could be a little impulsive sometimes but dear God, to have your own parents murdered in such a horrifyingly elaborate way I had no idea he was evil too. And that's what freaks me out about it. You'd never have guessed that Bart was capable of something like that. At least I didn't want to believe he was. I heard one of his parents actually survived and begged the state not to put him on death row. They succeeded too. So I guess that's some small silver lining from a horrifying little episode in my life. One rainy day when I was driving home, I came across this man who was walking. As I'm approaching him, I debate with myself if I should give this man a ride or not. It can be dangerous because you never know what can happen, but in the end I decided to stop and ask him if he needed a ride. When I stopped, I looked at him and my first thought is poor man, soaking wet, dirty clothes and with a face of someone that just lost everything. So I asked him, can I give you a ride sir? which he replies, a ride downtown will be appreciated. I told him of course and he got inside. When he entered the car, he didn't say a word. I tried making small talk but he wasn't answering. He just sat there looking into the void. After a few minutes I asked him if he wanted to eat something. It was late in the night but I could pass my house and make something for this man. I had established at this point that this man wasn't dangerous at all. He looked skinny and frail. The man answered, Yes, please. I haven't eaten in a few days. It didn't surprise me. I told him I would prepare something to eat, and I would arrange a place for him to sleep. When we arrived, I took the man to the kitchen. I told him to sit down, and I would prepare something for us to eat. He sat down, and I went into the fridge, and I saw what I could do for the both of us. I was actually hungry, too. But when I looked back to check the guy again, he was already gone. I couldn't find him anywhere. I had checked everywhere except in my basement. Usually my basement door is always locked, but for some reason this time it wasn't. So I made my way down the stairs and I see him standing in the middle of my floor, looking at me at the bottom of the stairs. 
I approached him slowly. Couldn't see his eyes, but he held an aggressive posture facing me. He then says, It was you. I don't understand, I said. At that moment, he shows me a necklace and says, This was my wife, and I found it here. It took me a long time, but I finally caught you. He draws out a knife from his pocket and he tries to slash my neck. He missed by inches but made me fall back. Once on the ground, I took my concealed handgun and I shot him twice in the chest. He fell to the ground. I got up and I shot him one more time just to make sure. And then I tell myself, I need to be more careful. You see, the thing is, I've done some messed up things in my past and this guy pretty much caught me. I guess I robbed his wife or something, but I couldn't let that situation unfold. I'm not going back to jail. So this happened last year when I was house sitting for my neighbor. He was in the hospital for a few days recovering from surgery, and I had been asked to stay in the house and keep an eye on his cats. The house was pretty small, but it was on a nice wide open property by the woods and there was a tiny swinging cat flap on the kitchen door where the cats could come and go as they pleased. The flap led into a screened in back porch and the house only had one bedroom. So I chose to sleep on the couch in the living room. After cleaning up, feeding the cats and watching some TV, I shut off all the lights and laid back on the couch. I had my phone out and was casually scrolling through Facebook when I heard the flap swinging back and forth. From where I was in the living room, I couldn't see the door because the counter was in the way, but I glanced over to see one of the cats scamper over and leap up on my legs. I gave it a welcoming pat on the head and continued scrolling. After another minute, I heard the cat door make a noise again, a soft squeak. This time, I didn't even glance over, figuring it was the second cat following the first into the house. Another few moments passed, then I heard the squeaking again. And then after another moment, it squeaked a third time. I looked up from my phone, wondering why the second cat was jumping in and out like that. I was wondering if I would have to scoop it up and put it in the bedroom. The door continued to squeak for another couple of minutes, as the second cat continued to jump in and out. I finally decided that I had enough. I put my phone down and sat up on the couch. I began to stretch. As I did, I happened to glance behind the couch and my blood froze. The second cat was curled up in its bed in the corner, and the first cat was still nestled between my legs. My confusion turned to fear instantly. Was there another animal on the back porch? Another cat maybe? I slowly stood up and carefully made my way over to the back door, tiptoeing across the carpet in my socks. The door made a squeaking noise again. I peered around the counter and felt the sensation of my heart leaping up into my throat. And at the same moment, my stomach dropped. By the faint rays of the nightlight in the hallway, I saw an arm reaching through the cat door, straining to get at the knob. The fingertips were brushing at the lock. For a few short seconds, all I could do was stare in terror, frozen by the surreal silent reality of what I was experiencing. It almost didn't feel real. The severity of the situation hit me, and I realized that if the intruder got in, I wasn't going to stand a chance. I grabbed a large two-pronged fork that was used for flipping steaks on a grill, and in one swift motion, I stabbed at the arm right below the wrist as hard as I could. There came a thunderous scream of pain from the other side of the door. and the arm was immediately retracted through the flap. But the fork had impaled the intruder, so it caught itself on the door. That produced a second loud scream, and the arm was wrenched violently outside. I heard the clatter of the fork on the ground, and then I heard footsteps sprint across the back porch and out the screen door. I immediately turned on the outside lights and caught the glimpse of a figure running towards the woods. Instead of calling the cops, I scooped up both cats stuffed them into the same carrier, grabbed my phone, my shoes, and sprinted out to my car, which was thankfully parked inside the garage. 
I drove up the road a couple of miles to my place, and once I was safely inside, I called the cops. It took them half an hour to get to my place, and then another half hour of questioning before they continued down the road to check out my neighbor's house. They told me that there was no sign that the screen door had been broken into, and aside from the bloodstains, there was no sign of the intruder. They put out an alert to local hospitals for a man with a stab wound on his right arm. The following morning, the police brought a dog out to follow the scent, but whoever the lucky bastard was, he was never caught. I kept the cats at my place until my neighbor was out of the hospital. It still shakes me to my soul, the idea that the stranger chose that house in the middle of nowhere, trying to get inside. And if I hadn't got off the couch when I did, this may have ended very differently. As far as I can tell, the sleep talking started a couple months ago. I pray it hasn't been any longer than that. For all I know, it could have been going on for weeks to years without my knowledge. How could I not know? We've slept in the same bed for over a decade, but I never noticed my wife saying anything in her sleep beyond an occasional moan or whimper. See, I'd been having issues with insomnia lately probably due to drinking more coffee at work. It's a bad cycle. I'd go into work tired, so I'd drink more coffee. I wouldn't sleep well. You get the drift. Anyways, I was lying awake at 3 a.m., staring into the blackness above me, when I heard her whisper something so low that it was almost inaudible. It was a name. Brad Johnston. Who in the world is Brad Johnston? I remember wondering. As I mulled it over, I fell asleep. The next day, I asked her about it. Who's Brad Johnston? She looked at me blankly. What? Genuinely flabbergasted. Brad Johnston, you said his name while you were sleeping. She just shrugged. I don't know. Never heard that name before. Sorry about that. Was it an ex-boyfriend, a character on a show she watches? I didn't know. I figured it could just be a coincidence. I shrugged it off. The next night, she didn't say anything. In fact, for a week there were no more whisperings that I was aware of. Seven days later, it was once again 3am. I was staring at the ceiling when I heard her whisper. Susan. The next morning, I asked her about it. Just like the first time, she couldn't tell me where she was getting these names from. After that, the names started coming faster. Kyle Traeger, Kim Tran, Lakeisha Jeffers, and so on. At first, it was one name a night. Then it was two. Then three. Then four. After a couple of weeks, I got the idea to start googling some of the more unique names. I wish I hadn't. From what I could tell, they were all names of people who had committed suicide. Brad had hanged himself, Susanna had taken pills, and Kyle and Lakeisha were jumpers. Search after search confirmed it. They had died the night she'd uttered their names. I wrestled with whether or not I wanted to share this information with her. I didn't know what good it would do. It's not like she knew what was going on. In the end though, that's exactly what I did. Of course, she was devastated to hear the news. She said she didn't ever want to sleep again, but she had to. And the names kept coming. And tonight, I heard my own name pass her lips. Christopher I've never made a noose before, but my hands sure seem to know what they're doing. 